Okay, September 24th. Uh, this is our third one. That's pretty amazing. We're uh, we're on a roll here. Didn't expect to do so many Wireshark classes. We did the first four Wireshark Wednesdays. Now we're in number three of this. So we're on a we're on a good clip. And once again, if we hit 70 minutes close to it, just uh, someone hit me up and, and tell me I'm getting close on time. Uh, how many of you, just curious, how many of you have uh, purchased the WCNA book? It's a pretty decent book. Okay, so whether it's the Kindle version or the the real version, it either way will work fine. But it is a very good book. Uh, you know, a lot of study books aren't so great, but this one actually is. So okay, so today we're doing chapters seven through nine. Seven's all about time. The different times they have, there's the Unix time, Linux time, there's time references, we'll cover all of that. Chapter 8 is looking at the file statistics, the basically everything in that statistics menu item up top. So basically getting a quick and dirty overview of what you captured. And that's probably one of the first places you're going to go to after you start a capture, is going to look at the statistics. And then chapter nine, we'll be looking at display filters. So we did capture filters before, that's capturing on the intake. This is display filters, what you're gonna filter out and look at after you capture everything. So some of this will be very familiar because some of the syntax is the same. If you type in UDP, it filters out UDP. ICMP is ICMP. But then you'll notice that other things are much different and the operators will be different as well. And disclaimers, the session is being recorded. The legal one, opinions expressed here represent my own. And off to announcements. Certification passes. Any certification passes in the last week? And anyone know of any cool trade shows coming up other than, uh, I know Mercon is coming up in uh, near Washington, D.C. High tech crimes, that might be done. Let's see, high tech crimes is over, was last, well, let's see. Yeah, high tech crimes looks like it's done. I know New York has their interop one coming up Seth Myers Nova Is that a trade show? That's a TV show. I'll bookmark that. Good find. All right. So chapter seven, time. Time is obviously very important. Uh, one of the things to remember that they might get you on on the test is just remember that Wireshark does not timestamp. Wireshark itself does not timestamp. It's up to the kernel or the, the win pcap, lib pcap. I think I spelled kernel wrong. You can kind of tell I'm on the <laughs> I'm on Mountain Dew. Dear God. Okay, Colonel, Lib PCAP, Win PCAP. Your Nick card can also timestamp. And also cool, this is a bonus to you guys. Arista can timestamp on the nanosecond level. And let me show you how to do that because I've been playing around with some Arista stuff. Okay. So most of you guys are Cisco guys. You guys know, or you should know, that switches do not change anything in the frame, right? Frame goes either through the switch or the switch kills it, drops it, right? This should come as no surprise to anyone. But an Arista switch can timestamp on a nanosecond level. 
then hand off, then fire off the frame, you know, make it continue. And then later on down the line, you can use Wireshark, capture it, and look at the nanosecond timestamps. So you may be wondering, okay, this is a switch. How the hell is it doing this? Well, the way it does it is everyone knows that you've got a frame. And at the end of the frame, you've got something called the FCS. And trying to do this with a mouse really sucks. But <laughs> FCS, who knows what the FCS stands for? That's close. Uh, frame check sequence, frame check sum, you know, either, either way is, is fine. So it's basically checking to see if the, the, this frame was corrupted, right? So what the Arista can do, it's got two modes. You can rip out the frame check sequence, recompute a new one, and, and add in the timestamp. So you can kind of think of it as it replaces the FCS with the timestamp. Or it can change the timestamp, keep the timestamp in there and append the, or it can change the frame check sequence and then append the timestamp. You can think of it as to the end. So that's pretty cool. Uh, now the, the Arista has a 350 megahertz, depending on the model, uh, but it's a 350 megahertz CPU. So the timestamps have a three nanosecond granularity. That's you can't really get closer than that because if you do the math, that's that comes out to to that. Uh, but it is a pretty cool cool uh, utility. Now, why would you want nanosecond timestamps? Well, Arista is used in high frequency trading, where basically every nanosecond matters. So, just a little trivia for you: if you ever deal with Arista stuff, that's kind of what they're known for. If you capture in PCAP mode, that's kind of the older format, you have microsecond precision. If you capture in the PCAP NG mode, that's where you can actually read nanosecond information. And for extra trivia, there's uh, the Wireshark time data, the UTC time, which is everything before the microsecond. So that's like the, the date and the time, you know, Tuesday, July 9th, the year, all that good stuff. And the, the hours and the seconds and all that stuff. That takes up four bytes of information. The microsecond part, everything after the dot in the seconds, takes up another four bytes. Okay. Let's do some hands-on. Hands-on is pretty fun. We're going to be doing, we're going to change the time display format. We're going to change the display, well that's kind of the same thing, change the time display format. And we're going to be looking at the different options you have up top in the menu bars. You're going to do time shifting. Time shifting is pretty cool. It's where maybe you foobarred your time and everything was off two hours. So you can actually time shift it two hours. You can do a time reference point. That's what we'll be doing. Uh, so normally, normally everything is done from the reference point of the first packet captured. But what we can do here is we can right click a packet and set that as a reference point. And we'll also be doing the delta time column. And that delta time col column is shows the number of seconds, the amount of time since the previous packet. So not since the first packet, since the last packet, which is very useful in determining delays in the network or the server's busy or the client's busy. And we'll talk about the different ways you can analyze that. So let's take a look at Wireshark. We'll pull it up here. And whatever connection you're on, select that guy. If you don't know, go to Capture Options. You could also go to Interface List. Interface List is probably better. Just look at your packets per second, and it's going to be the one that's increasing. Right? 
But as always, go to Capture Options, pick your interface. Mine's going to be a wireless network connection. And uncheck all this crap. Update list in real time, resolve MAC address, use external network name. Because video is going right now, and it's going to kill your system. So uncheck all the live stuff, and then click Start. And you'll see at the bottom, packets, that number should be increasing. Okay. Once it gets about, let's say, to 2,000 packets, you could stop the capture. Shouldn't take too long. And here we go, we stop it. All right, so I've got some columns. <laughs> I've got the column from last, last class, this row column. I'm going to kill that really quick. So how many of you still have the row column from, uh, from last class? We did that in like the extra time after class. Yeah, okay. No problem if you don't see it, that's okay. But if you do see it, here's how we're gonna get rid of it. There's a couple ways we can do it. We can uh, right click here. And down at the bottom, you've got displayed columns, hide column, remove column. So we could do displayed column. You see that row, just click on that and that nukes it out. Uh, those of you who have played with Excel, hide column, remove column, all that good stuff, same concepts apply. And how many of you does the time kind of look like mine? You've got a zero dot and then all zeros after it. So, you know, as you scroll down, it's basically telling you absolute time. So you started at all zeros and then you're you're going up. It's it's the time since you first started capturing. So if we go down here, then it's basically showing us 1.9 seconds since I first started. Here's 3.4 seconds, you know, so so on and so forth. Okay, so Sheldon says, mine increments more, but on a different network. So your time is incrementing more? Oh, captures on a different network. Oh, okay, that eh, should be all right. So this time format, it's, it's shown as seconds, right? And then we can change that. It's very easy. We can go up here. There's a couple things we could do. If we go to view, so file, edit, view, we have here time display format. Time display format. And we've got, you can see the dot on mine is seconds since the beginning of capture. But we can change that. We could change it to time of day. We could change it to UTC time. Now, how many of you guys are Linux and Unix people? We also have Epoch time, which is 1970-0101. Right, so you guys will love that for whatever reason. Right? So that, that will bring back some memories for you guys. And actually, that's that's one of the supposedly big bugs that's coming up when that thing rounds or basically flips over, right? So let's change this. Where this is non-destructive, it's not actually hurting anything. So we go up to View, Time Display, and let's just pick date and time of day. Date and time of day, and now my column gets really big. We've got 2014, 924, 1812 in my case. I have, this is doing local time, and then the microseconds afterwards. It can tell it's microseconds because the, the last three on this uh, seconds part, or subsecond part, is blank, so it's cutting it off at the microseconds. If it was nanoseconds, I'd have more stuff back here. We can go back to view and then time display format. You could change it to 
uh, UTC date and time. So UTC date and time, you can see mine is now 01 and it's the next day. And we could go back view time display format and let's see what else. Let's pick epic time. Let's see how that looks. Seconds since epic. Yeah, there we go. Dear God. So that's how that looks. Let's go back and change it back to our default, which is second, second since beginning of capture. Seconds since beginning of capture. It's back how we were. Okay, precision. Now this is kind of an ugly format. You may be thinking, okay, well, if not, if I'm not capturing down to nanoseconds, why, why even display these last three zeros? It's kind of, it's kind of dumb. So we can change that by going to View, Time Display Format, and it's within this same uh, menu here, the same set of things. You can see right here, down in the kind of the bottom half of this, we've got the precisions in the seconds, uh, tenths of a second, hundredths of a second, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, right? If you change it to seconds, it's going to just wipe out a lot, <laughs> right? It's not very granular right there. And you can experiment by changing to tenths of a second, hundredths of a second. I'm going to change it to milliseconds. That's all right. That's not too bad. And then finally, you can change it to microseconds. And that's, that's pretty good. That's not too bad. And was everyone able to change the display of the time to the different formats and also mess around with uh, precision? It's pretty easy. This is going to come in very handy. All this time analysis and looking at precision, all that, this comes in very handy when you're fighting with the SQL guys, particularly Microsoft SQL and Oracle people. Okay, let's take a look back at our, you can, you can keep the Wireshark open. We're just gonna flip over here. So time formats, time shifting and time reference. Okay, time reference. So let's say you're looking at this trace file and just scroll down to whatever packet, doesn't matter. Right? I'm just going down here. And so by default, everything is going off the first packet. So the change in time from the first packet. In my case right here, this is uh, 4.42 seconds since that time. But what if the packet I'm on is the start of something interesting, right? So this packet right here is where Edward Snowden started sending stuff, right? We've, we've got him. Why he was at Panda, I don't know, but we've got him right here. And I wanna set this as my reference point. This is my time zero. So I can do that. I can right click this guy. And the third one down, should be the third one down, is set time reference, set time reference. So right click, third one down, set time reference. And now that becomes the reference. Everything before stays the same. We don't change anything before, but everything since then is now computed against that reference point. All right, everything's computed against that reference point. And if you don't like it, you can just right click again, set time reference and toggle it off. Right. 
pretty useful tool. You can have multiple time references as you just saw me do. So you, you tick one and then you go down to another one and you reference that one as well. And all, all it's going to do, it's going to reset between the last one of the previous reference point and the beginning of the next one. I wish you had something to say like reference one, reference two, instead of just saying reference, but yeah, what can you do? And then to clear it out, right click, set time reference. Time shifting, well, for time shifting, what we can do is let's change our time format. Right now we're seconds. We want to change that to uh, the date and time. So we'll go up to view, time display format, and change it to the first one, date and time of day. Okay. So whatever time you have displayed, let's say someone royally screwed up. When they captured this, their clocks were jacked up. Right, so you've got uh, a newly hired MCSE. He hasn't figured out how to set the time on his uh, on his windows. Something like that, right? Could happen. And so we need to time shift this to get it to the correct time. Right. So we right click and select time shift. It's the fourth one down. And here, what you see is is something pretty cool zoom in a bit here you could shift all packets you could add like an hour to every packet you could set a particular packet to a time if you wanted to i'm not exactly sure what the third one is set packets to the time and extrapolate maybe it just references all uh, from that one but let's see let's see if we can get this to work Let's see if we can shift everything one hour. Let's see if we could do this. Okay, so if you type in plus one colon zero zero, you can keep this window up and cl keep clicking apply. You could see that my minutes column is incrementing. And conversely, if I change the plus to a minus, I should see things decrementing. So if one colon zero zero is minutes, let's see if I do another zero zero. There we go. So one colon zero zero colon zero zero. That's shifting it by the hour. And that's usually what you'll be doing is shifting it by the hour. So I'll zoom in a bit so you can see that format. Another instance where this might help is um, if you're doing any type of disaster, not disaster response, but um, so after you've been hacked, mitigation and uh, detection. So your company got hacked and you're trying to put together a timeline of what happened and you've got different devices on different pulling NTP time from different sources. So you know one trace is going to be a little bit off than the other one. <laughs> yes, time shift functions are not available on live captures. Yep. And you know Live captures, thousands and millions of packets could be coming in, so time shifting on that would, would not be cool. So time shifting can be used to sync up different trace files that were done on different parts of your network that use different NTP sources. Because if you're trying to do a timeline for a hack, it will be something like, at this time, the guy got through our firewall. At this time, we believe he, he accessed the window shares. At this time, he started accessing Active Directory. 
And then 10 minutes later, he got admin on Active Directory and started owning us. You know, it's kind of like how timelines go. Any questions about the time shifting and the time reference points? Pretty easy. Just get it through the right click and those two options right there. Yeah, Michael says piece of cake, and, and it is a piece of cake. I mean, a lot of this stuff you can find just kind of clicking around, and you're not going to kill anything if you mess up. It's pretty interesting stuff. Okay, a delta time column. So having this column with the time, it's cool, it's interesting. But it would be nice to have another column, maybe next to it, or somewhere in this, that shows the differences in time since the last guy. Right? So you do want to have a time column, but you want to have time column number two that shows changes in time. Right? You want to see if things are slow or fast. And we could do that pretty easily. We go up to Edit and Preferences. We're going to add another column, edit preferences, and under user interface, you're going to go to that second option there, columns. So click on columns. And then under field type down here, click the drop down. And it's pretty easy because it's one of the common ones. So they should have it right here, delta time. Delta time. So you click that guy, and if you were clicked on a row, it changed it. Eh, that's fine. So if you if you're clicked on the first guy and you change the field type, that's cool. That's just, then just change the title by saying delta time. And before it was hidden, and it's hidden because you see the check mark is gone because. We hit it by right-clicking the column. We can just get that column back by checking that box. If you want to just add a completely new column, you would just go down here, click Add, and then select Delta Time. And we click OK. And here's my Delta Time. Whoa. And what you may want to do here is you may want to change your font a little bit just so things don't do the run through each other. Or tell you what, I'm just going to kill my, my time column. Hide it. There we go. Ooh, that made it worse. All right. I will just keep it like that. <laughs> so my, uh, my delta time column, you can see right there. This, this is the change from the last packet. Change from the last packet. So how does that help you? Well, there's the TCP handshake. Right? So just as a review, you all know the TCP handshake is the SYN, SYN ACK, and ACK. That's where we talk from the client. Got a client right here. We want to talk to a server. We want to download some awesome files, right? This is like, uh, I'll just say L for Linux because usually it's, if they're smart, they're running Apache or Nginx or something. So we have a SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and then after ACK, if, if you're doing like a web page or whatever, then we're going to have like a data, some GET requests, you know, then, then the data starts flowing back to you, right? So FTP starts, your BitTorrent starts, uh, your Linux ISO starts downloading, that, that type of stuff. 
So if you have the delta column and you're looking at TCP, if you have a large delay between your SIN, and we joke around, this is the original SIN, the first one going off to the server. So you have a long delay, let's say it's a two second delay, let's say, in getting back. It could mean the, the network's all jacked up, it's busy, uh, possibly could mean the server is messed up. Uh, you know, if, if the delays between SYN and SYNAC, probably not you, probably not the client. If the delay is between the ACK, so the client sent out the ACK and the first data packets, maybe the network's okay, but the server's jacked up. It could also mean the network's bad, but I mean, if if the delay between the ACK and the first data packets is large, but all this before was fine, so everything above was okay, then probably not the network. It's probably the server side. SQL databases is messed up, the FTP, too many users on FTP, who knows, right? And if there's delay between the act and the, the get request, um, could be you. If, if there's a delay between you sending out the get request to get information, could mean the client is slow. Okay, back to our hackpad. Let's see what we did here. We did changing the time display format. We looked into precision, time shifting. We did the reference point. We added a delta time column, so that's cool. That's good. And we talked about delays between sin, sin, act, act, and all that good stuff. Filter bombed out, so we'll have to look at this later. See why that didn't work. But that is it for time stuff. Time is, is quite, a, quite a decently sized chapter in this book. But uh, the main points they want you to know is uh, Wireshark itself doesn't timestamp. They want you to know the differences between the PCAP and PCAP NG. Mainly it's the precision, microsecond versus nanosecond. If you want to do nanosecond stuff, it's you're going to be using something else to, to do it. So either a third-party NIC card, or Arista or something. And of course, they want you to know how to change the precision and the time display formats. Cool. Chapter 8, really easy. St statistics. Protocol hierarchy, most active conversations. So it's everything within that statistics menu option. Just kind of looking through it, and it's going to be, as I said before, your main kind of go-to item right after you stop the capture. You just kind of want to see like who's talking, where the conversation's going, how big are the packet lengths, that type of stuff. So it's your 30,000 foot view of what's happening within that particular trace. Right? So pretty easy, you go up here to statistics, you've got all this stuff, right? Summary and protocol hierarchy are kind of the go-to items. I like protocol hierarchy because I like to see what protocols are are being seen on my network, right? So you got your, your ethernet, your IPv4, well, hopefully you got ethernet, your IPv4, UDP, Got, you should have lots of UDP right now because you're on video, right? Video, you know, how many of you do not see 80 something percent of UDP? It should be, should be a fair amount. And here it's showing you your eh, 65, it's fine showing you the ARP and the bytes and the megabits a second, all that good stuff. So you could you could click on these columns if you wanted to. Nothing too interesting. Oh, doesn't look like you can click on them. But what you can do is throughout most of these statistic menus, you can right click. You can right click on any of those and apply them as filter. So you see down here where it says address resolution protocol. Maybe you have a couple, right? I've got uh, I've got two. 
not too not too much I can right click apply as filter and selected and it shows me the ARP stuff that it found right. so it's pretty nice if we go back to statistics and protocol hierarchy if we if I right click on ARP I could apply as filter not selected and say everything not ARP That's cool. Colorize protocol. You could color it different color if you wanted to. So protocol hierarchy, pretty pretty good go-to item. Uh, domain name service. Right-click, apply as filter, select it. Just a real quick and easy DNS stuff. Ooh, what's this? Google Cast. interesting and we'll clear that out going back to statistics summary page I don't really like this one because this tends to be people's brains tend to explode on this one this is it's not really I don't really call this a summary page this is more like information about your system it's like hardware info and information about the file and stuff like that. Not too much is good here except down here average megabits a second, average packet size, that type of stuff. Yep. And if we go back to statistics, endpoint conversations, conversations right here. Another good one. Conversations and endpoints. Very similar. If you go on endpoints, you're just going to see addresses, right? Which a lot of times is, is good enough. So if you have Ethernet, I saw nine MAC addresses. If you click on IPv4, you'll get others. Uh, TCP, get ports. So IPv4, you're just getting IP addresses, not not ports. When you go to TCP, you're going to get IP and ports. And right now you got like 443 and all types of different stuff. And we've got UDP over here. Right? And once again, if you if you go, let's say, if we go to IPv4 and you right click on any of these, you can apply as filter. So if you see some strange IP addresses, apply as filter. I can't tell you how many times people have caught like Trojan horse or some, you know, malware or something just because they've started up Wireshark. They've looked at IPv4 like nothing was happening. Like they weren't on any website or anything. You know, they closed down all applications. Um, and the way you can close down all applications, use a program. I don't know if it's still available, but I used it back in the good old days. End it all. Maybe it's still out there. Uh, end it all. <laughs> you start fire that up. Uh, you click the skull and crossbones. It kills out every process. Then fire up Wireshark and see what's happening. And you'll just, if you see anything going to Russia, that's probably a bad sign. Russia and Romania. And Vietnam. All right, going back to stati uh, statistics, conversations is where it's A talking to B, and you're seeing who's the top talkers, the top conversations in between them. All right, so this is a little bit different. You're seeing conversation pairs. And this is basically just a text version of an uh, old program way long ago. Uh, it should still be out. I used it back in the days. Let's see if I can pull up the image here. 
There we go. Ether Ape. This was, uh, it basically put up, it sniffed the traffic, drew out the conversations, and then depending on how big the conversations, lines are drawn in between. And if it's a really big fat line, then it means that it was like a huge burst of traffic. This was good back like, oh, it's about 10 years ago on DEF CON. And you would just have this uh, running on the DEF CON network. And people go, wow, that was, like, that was like a lot of traffic. The problem with this is since everyone at DEF CON knew that Etherape was being was running, they would spoof a whole bunch of IP addresses and just your graph would just become insane after about 10 seconds. You know, so it looked like that. So what you're seeing in Wireshark is, is the text rep is it's a text version of this. It's a good program. I think it is still on um, Backtrack. Well, it's not called Backtrack anymore. It's called uh, Kali Linux. All right, we'll close out our conversations. And the last thing we'll take a look at in statistics is packet length, packet length. Oh, click the wrong one. There you go. Okay, packet length. We have a filter here. We could just create stat. If you create stat, it just gives you the default. So we've got packet links, 0 to 19, 20 to 39, all that good stuff. And then you have the big ones, 51, 20 to God knows what, right? So packet length, why is this important? You just bought a Synology box, a NAS box. Your company just bought a NetApp, whatever, right? Some big, big cabinet full of hard drives and SSDs. You were promised that you could pull 10 gigabits a second through this thing and you're only getting like 800k. Well, hopefully you're not getting 800k, but you're getting significantly lower speed or throughput than you were promised. So why is that? Well, you would fire up Wireshark. Well, you do a transfer, fire up Wireshark, capture it, then come here to packet links, and you take a look, right? If you don't see any packets above 1500, then you could safely assume that Jumbo frames are not enabled on your network. So that could be a problem. Uh, how do you get the packet length? Very easy. You go up here to statistics, packet lengths. Click on that. Now you have a filter. The filter will let you do stuff like IP only, whatever. But if you just click create statistic without the filter, it will give you all the packet links. That filter just gives you an option to say, okay, just give me the packet links of all TCP. So what you see here on my screen is kind of a typical, like, okay, well, you know, it's got a lot of, uh, a lot of small packets, 160 to 319. Uh, that's that's okay. That's indicative. Yeah, I'm streaming. I'm doing stuff. And it could also, if you see a lot of small packets, uh, if you play World of Warcraft, any type of MMO, any type of like um, Call of Duty, Counter Strike, any online game that requires a lot of movement, a lot of clicking, and you you Wire Shark during the game, you're going to see a lot of small packets because those are movement. Um, uh, not movement, but uh, position updates. Right, so when you go forward, go left, right in World of Warcraft, that's being sent out as very small packets. So this is kind of normal. If I started a big wire, a uh, big transfer to my Synology box at home, what I should see is the packet links for 1500 and up packets to be higher you know i might have like 80 percent 
as those large packets. And there's one other cool statistic that we can look at, uh, the graph. We've got a couple of graphs, but the, the main one is the IO graph. If you click on IO graph under statistics, this is on the right side, it gives you the kind of up and down, you know, how much traffic was being transferred at what time. So if you see kind of like a staircasing effect, it could be an MTU issue, it could be a TTL issue. You know, you send traffic and then you hit that, uh, not TTL, but the windowing, the TCP window, and you're stopped for like a split second and then you transfer up again and then you stop, transfer up, stop. Very similar to what you would see in like uh, if you use uTorrent, any, any type of BitTorrent program, and you click on the speed column, and that's what you're looking at as well. And for you guys that are fans of BitTorrent, Wireshark helps troubleshoot a lot of BitTorrent problems. Okay, we'll close out of there. So that's pretty much it for statistics. They just wanted, want you to know like what can you find in statistics and that pretty much anywhere in statistics you can right click and create a filter for that, for those entries, just to make your life a lot easier. Any questions about statistics? All right, moving right along. We're doing pretty good on time. That was chapter eight. Chapter nine, display filters. Yeah, display filters. So we covered capture filters before. Some of this will be very familiar. We have display filters ca that can filter out DNS, ARP, ICMP, TCP. These are the common ones right here that you see on the screen. And I know we've done this before millions of times. Right. So if we go into Wireshark and we type in DNS, we're just going to get DNS. Down at the bottom, you'll see that on my screen, packets 2119, I'm displaying six. So it's telling me how many are on the screen right now. So Michael has a question. What are some of the lower entries in statistics? If we come up here. Yeah, I really don't go here that much. Uh, the flow graph I go to, the flow graph, oh, let me clear this out. So the problem with, the thing with statistics is remember to clear out your filters before you go to statistics, because you don't want those statistics just on the displayed packets. So if you go here, let's go to flow graph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it can, it can crash. So flow graph just sh shows the back and forth of stuff. Uh, you can just click OK. And let's expand this out. This is like a wall of data. Whoa. So it will, it gives you kind of like, this is talking to this guy, this is talking to this guy, this started here, this IP to that guy. So on a time, on basically a millisecond, microsecond basis, you could scroll through and it's a graphical representation. All right, so it's, it's just taking that information of conversations and data transfer and just putting it in somewhat of a graphical representation. Yeah, and, and it can have a chance to crash if you had a lot of packets. So that that's a pretty useful one. Uh, actually, the, the general flow is not that great, but if you go to flow graph and TCP flow, probably a lot better. And then click OK. This is where you get the ACK, SYNACK, all that stuff. Right. 
so what this means, it, this is trivia. You, you, um, this is extra credit here. So what this means is sequence equals one, act equals one. It's basically saying that um, I'm expecting segment one and I'm asking for segment one. As we go down here, it's basically saying, okay, I'm sending segment 1261, 2522, 2521, 4171, all that good stuff. But that you can see the ACK is still one. So I've sent all this crap over, but the other side hasn't acknowledged receiving my, my stuff yet. And then finally down here, sequence equals one, ACK equals 2521. And so now, the other guy has basically said, oh, I've gotten 2521. I'm good up until that point. And here you can see 4171, 4171. So that's how this conversation is going. So the TCP one is probably a little bit more useful to you. Let's see if there's another one in statistics that's interesting. TCP stream graph. I've never used that throughput graph. Let's check that. Yeah, it might be interesting. I don't have a lot of throughput. I wish they would normalize this graph, but I'm sure you could find some stuff if you look through this. There's some wireless stuff. Uh, there's HTTP, HTTP requests. That could be good. Yeah, well, I didn't go to any web pages. So that's going to look pretty boring. But yeah, you could just kind of play through these. Okay, back to display filters. You guys know, type in DNS, DNS. TCP, ICMP, all that good stuff. I didn't do any ICMP. TCP, they'll come up a lot. So. That part's not a mystery to you. You've seen that before. What is kind of new is we haven't really covered it that much is the operation, the operators. Operators are uh, equal sign, double equals, uh, not is the exclamation mark and equals, greater than, less than, you guys know that. Greater than, equal to, you know, that's that stuff that if you're used to programming, it should be somewhat familiar to you. So we have stuff like if you wanted, I give you some examples down here, HTTP request method and get request basically says, get me the page, get me a picture, get me something. And ICMP type double equals eight, right? So ICMP types, I have a list of ICMP types that you can click on and this just takes you to the IANA page. And if you say eight is echo, type zero is echo reply. So we can actually run a live capture. Let's do ICMP type, let's do that. So we'll clear everything out and we'll start a new capture. And we'll continue without saving. Don't need to save. So now stuff is just th streaming through in the filter box, type in ICMP dot type. Now we can we can hit enter right here if we wanted to, and that's fine. We'll just hit enter. This is going to give us all ICMP type. Open up command line, and let's see if we can get this thing to work. So command line, it's looking at all ICMP. So if I type in ping, CNN dot com. I should get a ping. You see that under info, that's a ping request. It's time output, no big deal. All right, we can cancel that. I can ping dash F that says don't fragment dash L. And let's do 2000. That's definitely not going to fly there. And who should we ping with that? www.fbi.gov. It's not going to work. It's not even going to get to fbi.gov. But 
Okay, so we get packet needs to be fragmented, but DF set. Now you can see that my Wireshark shows nothing. That's because the computer said, you crazy. Didn't even send it out. But if we did this, if I change to 2000, whoa. Okay, hit the up row, change to 2000, erase a zero. Let's see, request timed out. Okay, so that's not a big deal. <laughs> the FBI has chosen not to respond to my pings, but you can see the echo request is going out. Let's find someone that does respond. Ping 8888. There we go. So here we should see an echo request and an echo reply. And now you can stop your capture. So let's say you just wanted to see echo replies, stuff coming back. Right? So stuff coming back. Well, if we look at our list of the IANA ICMP, we know that echo reply is type 0. Type 0. So we know that double equals says equals something. We'll do quote, zero, quote. Let's see if that actually works. Oh, no quotes there. It's a number, so just double equals zero. Let's see if that actually works. Yeah, that works. ICMP.type double equals zero. And we just get the echo replies, the ping replies. Is everyone able to get that to work? Yeah, it should be easy. Now, of course, if you change that 0 to an 8, you're going to get all the echo requests. And, of course, if you change it to uh, whatever the time exceeded one is, the type 11 that's time exceeded, that's kind of the main ones. Destination unreachable, type 3. Yeah, let's see, type 3. So change the 8 to a 3. Yeah, we didn't get any of those. Or none that actually came back with that type. Now, I know you guys are saying, okay, I could have made the same filter by just clicking on any one of these packets clicking down here to ICMP message protocol, expanding that one out, you see type right here. If I click on that and right click, you can actually make that as a filter. That works the same way. A perfectly valid way of making a filter. So you can right click, apply as filter, selected. That fills in ICMP type equals eight does the same thing, but after a while, if you do Wireshark enough, you'll just type it in the filter box right here. It's kind of like Cisco ASA. If you're on the command line enough, you'll type it out faster than going on the ASDM. Okay. And then I have some other examples here. If you want to get complicated with your filters, uh, there's stuff that you can add in to concatenate and pipe and all that stuff. So you could do stuff like the, I think it's the double ampersand right there. I can get you a list of operators. Yeah, so in the, in the hackpad, I gave you a link to a list of operators. If you click on that, you've got the logical end. So you could say, give me ICMP type 8 and type 0. Or is the double pipe. 
the knot, just a regular, uh, the logical knot is just the uh, exclamation mark. X or holy crap. Yeah, we don't want to get go there. So let's give it a shot with and. There'll be a simple one. So we know that we got stuff when we did ICMP type equals 8. We know we got stuff with ICMP type equals 0. Let's see if we could get both 0 and 8. So let's see. Double ampersand ICMP type equals 8. So that should give us the echo reply and echo request. Oh, let's do or on that one because that is probably impossible. I was just thinking through the logic on that. I was like, how is it going to be a type 0 and a type 8? That's not going to work. So ICMP type double equals 0, double pipe. ICMP type double equals 8 means give me all the echo replies. If they match that, that's cool. Or if they match all the echo requests. That makes a little bit more sense. Uh, where you can do the and stuff is you could do stuff like, uh, how would we do this? You could probably write a rule saying, there we go, ICMP type equals zero, so all the echo, all the pings going to and from a certain IP display that. So all the pings going to CNN, all the pings going to 8.8.8.8, .8 .8, something like that. And you could play on forever with display filters. Now if you want to, if you get kind of stuck on the syntax for display filters, Pretty easy. If you just click on filter right here to the left of that, and filter is right here. So if you click on filter, you can easily make different ones. If you click on expression in the bottom right hand corner, this is all the, all the, oh my god, all the protocols that, that you have. There's some just funky ones that are just way out there. You can look for HSRP. NASDAQ total view. There's just, you know, it's pretty pretty educational just going through here. SMTP, Doxis. Hey, look at cable modem stuff, right? So you could have lots of fun with that. Right. And if you want, if you said ICMP type equals 8, right, and you don't ever want to type that again, you can save that and you could call it ping filter. Click OK. And now you have this as a saved filter right there in your filter bar. So you could have a filter just on a particular employee's workstation, right? You know, we could do like uh, the Edward Snowden filter. Okay, I think we're coming up on 70 minutes, pretty much right on the dot. Any questions about display filters? It's a pretty decent chapter in the book. Lots of stuff to, to look at. And uh, it's actually, it's a pretty fun chapter going, going through it. And the book has trace files to work with, and it has a link to go to her, Laura Chappelle's website, so you can play around with it. But I find it a lot better just to play around with the trace files done on your home computer. It's more interesting.
that way. Especially if you have Macs and you have Cisco devices, you have a Synology box. Uh, it's just always interesting to see weird stuff going through your, your network.